Well, hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, with me today, I've got the Director of Government Relations here at the AMA, Tyler Dobbs. Tyler, thank you so much for coming and sitting down and talking a little bit of government relations with me today. No, happy to do it. Uh, appreciate the invite and yeah. excited about the show today. Yeah, so we just want to kind of have a conversation and talk about what's going on in the world of, uh, of government regs. I know there's a lot of things changing and um, just want to kind of clear up some some things, I think, and, and talk about what's been going on. So uh, I know you guys just got back from D.C. last week. You took the entire executive council out there. Is that right? We did. The council went with us. Um, Chad Badro, the executive director of AMA, and Rich Hansen, uh, the president of AMA, Randy Cameron, vice president, and a number of the council went to D.C. Uh, it was a great trip. We uh, we started the day um, with some meetings, internal meetings about AMA, and had some guest speakers come in from the industry. AOPA came in and spoke with us. Uh, the Alliance for Drone Innovation came in and spoke with us. The executive director of the FAA UAS Integration Office, Jay Merkel, he was there uh, to give us an update on how things are going on the FAA side of things, um, and just to answer some questions that AMA has yeah. because. Um, you know, this is a brand new process. AMA's never been through this before. The FAA's never been through this before. Um, there's a lot of misinformation out there. A lot of information is changing all the time. Um, AMA and the FAA may decide to go in one direction one day. That may change two or three times before we actually get right. to the implementation process of it. So, um, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a work in progress. Things uh, are very fluid and uh, we're changing and being flexible when we need to be. So yeah. um, just, you know, basic questions on, on how we can make this implementation of the new regulations easier, um, you know, what AMA needs to do to provide information, things that FAA can do to make things a little bit more helpful for our members. So um, it was a great day. We followed that up with uh, some meetings on the Hill, meeting with our uh, council members, senators and representatives. Um, that was great, got to share how the implementation process process is going, got to share some of our concerns about things moving forward. So um, a lot of good discussions, excellent discussions. Uh, we, we have a lot of champions on the Hill asking how they can make things easier for us. Um, so that's a good opportunity to, you know, have all the districts represented, not that they aren't um, you know, every other day of the week, but right. um, it's, you know, Congress is, is much more willing to listen to someone in their in their area, One of their constituents, you know, their constituents yeah. in their district. So um, it's helpful to have them come in and give an update on their, you know, their state or their district. So I assume then, I mean, it sounds like it's a pretty successful trip. And it was, it was yeah. a successful trip. Um, anytime we get face to face time with senators and representatives, it's, right. that's always helpful. Um, and we got that opportunity this trip. And I think um, that's a benefit for our members. Anytime that we can remind them what AMA does, what our focus is, how we're out there trying to educate the general public. Yeah. We're out there trying to train youth on how to fly properly and, and with our, all of our STEM initiatives and um, other opportunities. Uh, that is a benefit to the UAS industry as a whole and it's a benefit mm -hmm. to our members. So. Now, uh, I know one of the more recent kind of uh, things that we've been mm -hmm. talking about are the letter of agreement processes for um, flying sites and, and our clubs to, they've got to come up with these letters, letters of agreement. And I would talk to me a little bit about what that process is looking like and um, how you see that, how you see that to kind of uh, evolve in the future. Sure. So it's been a long process. Um, it's had a few false starts. Uh, the, again, this, this whole, th process is new to both the FAA and the AMA. Um, so the FAA came to us a few times and said, let's try it this way. And we found out those ways didn't work. Yeah. Um, I think we have a process now that's going to stick and it's been working relatively good. Um, we reached out to club officers in controlled airspace with a questionnaire. Those questions were developed by the FAA and by AMA. Now, when you say controlled airspace, you're talking obviously class B, class C, yeah, uh, B, C, D, and the surface area of E. And okay. um, E is, is uh, 
somewhat more difficult for people to understand. Um, sometimes there's, it's easy to say controlled airspace is an area that has a control tower, um, yeah. but there's areas of Class E at the surface that doesn't have a control tower, right. so you can't always go by that. But um, regardless, if, if you're in B, C, D, or the surface area of E, you're required to have a letter of agreement with air traffic control on how you can operate yeah. um, for your fixed flying sites and for any sanctioned events that are happening, maybe right. at a location that's not your everyday flying site. If right. you go to a reservoir or a park or something once a year, um, then that area is going to need a, a letter of agreement also. Um, but so we've been working on that process. And basically, as I mentioned, we have a questionnaire we've developed. It's pretty basic. Who's the safety officer? Who's the point of contact? Um, what times during the day do you fly? Uh, how how many days a week are your lo is your location open? Those types of things. Um, once we get that questionnaire, then we send it off to the FAA in DC, uh, the Air Tra Traffic Operations or ATO. Um, they're working with us closely on this. They in turn make sure all the questions have been filled out correctly. They chart that location. Um, which is a point we can get to after this is is the FAA UAS facility map. I know a lot of our members have questions on that, but um, but they chart that location and then they send that questionnaire to the local air traffic facility to start the letter of agreement process. So um, once you submit the questionnaire, expect air traffic in your area to reach out. Some have been reaching out in days, others have been waiting a month uh, yeah. and still haven't been contacted. So uh, there's just like amongst our clubs and, and AMA headquarters, um, some people submit the questionnaire quicker, uh, some some wait months. Um, well, the same thing <laughs> happens with the FAA. Uh, right. You know, some reach out and want to get it out of the way and others maybe don't feel as it's a top priority. And, yeah. and so um, they've been delayed. But regardless, at some point, air traffic will reach out. Um, for those clubs who don't have a letter of agreement in place yet in, in controlled airspace, the FA has assured us they can continue to operate under past agreements. Um, so continue doing that until air traffic reaches out. If you have any issues when we're working through this air traffic process, you know, reach out to AMA headquarters and, mm -hmm. and we're happy to assist. Um, we brought Tony Stillman in. He's our safety director. We brought him to, into some of these conversations and he can make a strong case um, for, you know, operating as you have in the past. Yeah. Um, you know, the FAA's data driven and, you know, they, they're risk driven. So we need to stress you've been operating in that location for decades and there haven't been any safety concerns then you know, we're going to need a good excuse as, or a good reason as to why we can't continue to do that. Right. Uh, we'd like to see some data. We'd like to see some, you know, risk analysis that says that we're an issue in that part of the airspace. So, And, you know, one of the things I know that I tend to kind of fall back on is, to me, the FAA isn't the bad guy. Like, they're, they're, they have good intentions. They're sure. trying to keep people safe, sure. you know. They are. For manned aircraft, and I get that. And... But to your point, you know, you, we've got clubs all over the place that have operated for decades without any kind of problem, without any safety concerns. And, you know, to your point, I think protecting those clubs and their right to fly where they're flying is kind of a priority. Yeah, I mean, it has to be. Um, the FAA is, I mean, they're a safety organization. They want to make sure that the airspace is safe. They want to make sure that, you know, they want to get... Um, Incidents in the airspace to zero. That's right. their goal. They want, and I, I fly all the time, so I get that. I'm, I'm glad that they're safety oriented, yes. and um, you know, I, I don't want to have a risk of, of being on a full scale aircraft <laughs> and there, there be an issue. Um, but yeah. in turn, uh, you know, we need to protect what model aviation is all about, and we need to recognize that model aviation is a stepping stone to where that pilot that's flying the plane I'm in probably got his start in model aviation. Right. So um, we take him out of the loop for model aviation, and maybe that guy's now a truck driver, or an Uber driver, exactly. something like that, um, because they picked up a remote control car instead of a remote control airplane. I mean, and that's the, that's <laughs> the thing, you know, one of the one of the uh, the biggest things I try to talk to people about. Uh, I talked to a lot of people just this past weekend about how model aviation is such a huge stepping stone for uh, pilots, for engineers, for, I mean, all, is astronauts. I mean, yep. we have this built-in path and stifling that at the grassroots level is, I, I feel like, a pretty dangerous thing. So making sure that that's protected um, it seems like a, a huge deal to me. It is. It is a big deal. And, you know, and I 
the FAA, they're under-resourced. I mean, they're understaffed, yeah. they're under-resourced. The 2018 FAA reauthorization gave them stacks of mandates, didn't yeah. give them additional funding, didn't give them additional people. So I get it. Their easiest approach is let's use this one size fits all approach and just lump everybody in. Unfortunately, that just doesn't work for us. So right. um, I understand that they have a tall order to fill, yeah. um, but we're just going to have to find a way to do it. Because but, it but it seems like they're working with us pretty well to are. try to, uh, you know, let us have some say in how some of these things work. And, and we'll talk about, you know, like the safety and knowledge test sure. thing. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. Um, what I want to I want to kind of steer toward now is the Lance process. Okay. So I know a lot of folks here have heard that that acronym Lance. Can you just kind of short and sweet tell me what Lance is and what that looks like for the hobbyist moving forward? Sure. So as of right now, if you're flying in controlled airspace, that can only be done at fixed flying sites that have a letter of agreement in place. Mm -hmm. Whether that letter of agreement is finalized or not, um, again, I mentioned you can still operate under past written agreements or even verbal agreements. But regardless, as of right now, um, fixed flying sites in controlled airspace require an agreement with air traffic control. Mm -hmm. That will not always be the case. Um, we are hearing the date of July 23rd is when Lance will go live for recreational users. And what Lance is, is it's basically an online portal that gives you authorization to fly in controlled airspace in an almost real time. So you get on your phone and you open up a Lance app, which is provided by a number of service providers. Um, I think there's you know 10 or 11 or maybe even more by now. Um, but you log on to that, it knows your location like Google Maps or one of these other mapping uh, apps. And basically you ask to fly at that location up to a pre-approved altitude that has been set up by the uh, air traffic control in that area. So um, you can go to the FAA UAS facilities maps. You can just Google that FAA UAS facility map and mm -hmm. it'll take you to where you need to go. Um, it'll show grids over controlled airspace with, with altitudes. Basically at the airport, it starts at zero and sure. as you kind of move out of flight patterns and, and away from the airport, it goes up to 400 feet. So. Um, You'll look at that grid, you'll say, oh, okay, I'm on the outer ring here, I can fly up to 400 feet. Um, if you need to fly up to 400 feet, that's what you can request. You can request anything at 400 or below. Um, and in almost real time, you'll get approval or denial for that flight. I, I know I've used it for commercial purposes in the past. I mean, it was seamless. It was super easy. Um, you know, yes, it adds a step. From a recreational standpoint, it's gonna it'll, it may add a step in certain situations, but I think once people actually go through it, they're gonna be like, okay, that's not that that wasn't that big right. a deal. And at the end of the day, it's providing information to local air traffic controllers, letting letting them know, okay, this activity is gonna be going on over here. It's 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 all about safety, you know. Sure. So. Well, and in the past, you know, we had to notify all airports within five miles of where right. we were flying, and now, now you don't have to do that. If you're in uncontrolled or Class G airspace, um, you no longer have to notify. You just go out and fly. Right. Uh, this is only for controlled airspace in B, C, D, or uh, the surface area of E. And, and that's the thing I think a lot of people don't realize is like this is taking the place of, um, you know manually calling every single air traffic or every single airport within five miles right. or whatever it is. I mean, there were folks that were having to call, okay, we've got our local airport, we've got, you know, six helipads, you know, we've got a, a hospital that's got a helipad, we've got this farmer Joe down the street who's got a crop duster and his sure. his uh, farm is technically an airstrip. You've got to call these people. This kind of takes all that away and simplifies it into one. It does. It does. I would caution, you know, I think our members, you know, it's it's not a requirement now, but if you are in a location, you know, maybe you have a neighbor who's got some low visibility where they take off and land or something mm -hmm. and you guys still fly there a lot. It doesn't hurt to keep that relationship open. Sure. So just because it's not the law doesn't mean that you shouldn't have good communication because at the end of the day, we do want to make sure everybody's safe. So yeah. it doesn't hurt, pick up the phone and you know, if you're having an event or, or something that you typically don't do, maybe you're at an altitude you're typically yeah. not at, um, certainly doesn't hurt to keep More communication, communication the is, better. is always better. So, I completely yeah. agree. Um, now, all of that was kind of, we talked about, you know, the letter of agreement process for controlled airspace. 
What if you're in uncontrolled airspace? What if you're in Class G? So in Class G airspace, um, there is going to be another letter of agreement process. Um, and it's a little early to talk about uh, just because, as I previously mentioned, uh, what AMA and the FAA have been working on, it changes you know, 20 times before we get to the final product. Right, right, right. But just an overview right now, and again, don't hold me to these words because it could change a few times. We're looking at um, buckets, basically, and um, we're going to enter letters of agreement for our fixed flying sites in Class G airspace. And that's going to basically serve as a waiver to allow them to, them to continue flying over 400 feet. Uh, just like a Part 107 operator has to get a waiver to fly above 400 feet, mm -hmm. um, this letter of agreement will be a one-time waiver or a permanent waiver, I guess is a better word. Um, so you'll sign this and, and then you can operate above 400 feet. Um, the buckets will likely be because uh, because G Class G airspace and Class E airspace, um, you enter Class E when you get to certain heights, and that yeah. may be 700 feet or 1,200 feet or even you know much higher if you're in uh, you know unpopulated areas. Mm -hmm. But regardless of that, you maybe there's going to be one bucket of clubs that are going to fly above 400 feet, but not cross into Class E airspace, and that's one bucket. And then another bucket where, um, you know, maybe they're just getting into the lower level of Class E. And, and so we're working out what these buckets are going to look like. Um, but within the next few weeks, um, maybe a month, we're going to be reaching out to all of our clubs in Class G and saying, hey, we have this questionnaire. It's going to be similar to what the controlled airspace clubs are using. Um, we just need a little bit of information so we can get these letters of agreement put in place. Yep. And um, that's going to allow these clubs to continue operating as they have in the past. And same thing for sanctioned events. Um, we're, we're going to be starting that process. If you're having a sanctioned event that is not at a flying site that has a letter of agreement, um, whether it be in, in controlled or uncontrolled, um, we, we may be reaching out and saying, hey, we need you to fill this questionnaire out. Controlled airspace, all sanctioned events outside of a fixed flying site that's already got a letter of agreement will need one. In Class G airspace, if you want to fly over 400 feet, you're going to have to fill out this questionnaire so we can get a letter of agreement for that event. So, okay. um, And there, again, questions are pretty easy, straightforward. Usually just takes people a few minutes to fill out. Right. Um, if people have, because look, there's no question, this can feel very cumbersome and, and can feel very complicated, I think, to, to a lot of folks out there. If they have questions about these letters of agreement, who do they need to contact? Contact AMA headquarters. Um, the Gov Department's always willing to help. Uh, Ilona Maine with the club. She's the club director. Um, she's been working with us alongside uh, since the beginning of this, so she's a great resource. So um, contact AMA headquarters, and we will point you in the right direction. Get yeah, I, I can't emphasize enough to, to folks to give us a call and utilize the staff we have here to help you, help guide you through this process, because we know that it's... It's not an easy thing to yeah. wrap your head around all these legislative issues and, and whatever. But that's why we're here. That's why we're, you know, we're, we're here to help you guys maintain your flying sites and maintain your ability to, to operate the way you have been for, and, for years. And it's going to be a bumpy. I don't want anybody to be under the illusion that we won't run into some bumps along this process. There have already been some, and there will be more. Again, sure. this is brand new. It's going to be a bumpy process, um, but we're going to come out on the other side, and we're still going to be flying. Yep. We're still going to be doing what we were doing this time last year. Um, you know, if you're in a sensitive location, those are really the issues that the FA is looking at. Is is your flying site in a sensitive location? Uh, you know, on the approach or landing pattern of. Mm -hmm. of a large airport. Um, have you had issues in the past where maybe law enforcement or the FAs had to reach out and say, hey, um, you guys need to, to check your flying because there's yeah. been some issues here. Um, those are the issues that that have resulted in maybe some lower altitudes being negotiated and yeah. things like that. Um, but this is a mutually agreed upon operating procedure. So that, that means that both sides should have input, both the FAA and the, the AMA club. So um, make sure that your input's heard. If the FAA wants to restrict you at your location, you know, say, okay, um, you know, we, we would like to see some data to back up what you're saying. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we know that the FAA is data-driven. We know that you're a risk-based 
organization. So we would like to see some proof of this. Um, and also, you know, maybe put it on a 60 day trial. We've heard of a club that said, hey, we'll accept this altitude, but we'd like this readdressed in 60 days. And if we fly, you know, if there's been no incidents, then maybe we'll discuss raising that altitude to a higher, you know. It seems like the FAA has been open to those They have scenarios. been. Uh, again, it, this is all new. It's going to really depend on the relationship you have with your local air traffic control facility, right. um, the safety record at your flying site. So there's a number of aspects that they're going to take into account. Um, the, the more focused you are on safety, the better you're going to end up. At and and I would imagine the, the more cordial you are with that your... That certainly doesn't <laughs> hurt. Um, yeah, the... the in my experience, when someone comes up yelling and screaming to me, I'm less <laughs> willing to, to help. But, um, you know, maybe there's people out there that uh, don't feel that way. But yeah, that's um, all right. being nice goes a long way. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, one of the things I hear uh, quite a bit is we've got a lot of, we've got an influx of, uh, of new pilots that are operating multi-rotors, operating drones, um, that may not necessarily know what it means to be safe in the airspace. And there's a lot of concern over, you know, whether or not that's kind of pushing some of these regulations in the way that they're going. But what are some of the things that, that the AMA is doing now to help educate those new pilots and help guide them in the right direction. Sure. So, um, you know, I think we can even start that at uh, the local level. Uh, we have a number of clubs that have, you know, come, you know, come with us on Saturday and we'll teach, we'll teach the youth yeah. how to fly. We have clubs that go to elementary schools once a month and they mm -hmm. have a training program. I mean, so, um, you know, it's not just at AMA headquarters that are trying to, you know, do outreach and bring right. the newcomers into the fold. Our clubs have really taken the bull by the horns on this and, and have been helping out a lot. Um, at the headquarter level, obviously we started the Know Before You Fly campaign mm -hmm. back in 2014 with AUVSI uh, and the support of the FAA on that. And that's something that we continue. We did a big educational push last year. Um, we continue to do educational pushes this year. That was mentioned in the 2018 reauthorization bill is mm -hmm. that the FAA can spend uh, up to a million dollars a year on the No Before You Fly campaign. Uh, that money has to be appropriated and we hope that Congress does because, yeah. um, and that was something that we spoke on our last trip is, uh, you know, we get these new regulations put in place and it, you know, it's got a big effect on AMA and we are yeah. the rule followers, um, you know, and, and we are the ones that are pushing safety in the airspace. And these new rules often don't make it their way to the newcomers or the people who are right. causing some of the problems. Um, so we stress to Congress, you can create all the rules you want, but if the, P if the general public isn't aware of these rules, then it's not going to do much good. Right. Um, and here's your opportunity give the FAA that million dollars a year that you need so that programs like Know Before You Fly can educate the general public. Um, so we hope they do do that. That would be a huge boost over the next five years. They could get a million dollars each year. Um, and that would help That would help educate a lot. Uh, we're constantly looking for new ways to get Know Before You Fly out and you know get that message out. I know with that, uh, again, local clubs are doing similar projects and a number in the industry, a number of, you know, other UAS stakeholders in the industry are doing the same, uh, but we certainly can use all the extra help we can get. So. Well, I know one of the things that um, is kind of on the horizon to go along those lines is uh, there's going to be a whole week dedicated to uh, UAS safety information. Uh, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, and we don't know the date yet. Um, it's going to be sometime in November, but it's basically going to be a, a week of, uh, you know, aviation safety week. And mm -hmm. um, that'd be a good opportunity. We, we hope it's the first week in November. That's our AMA Expo. And yeah. I think that would tie in nicely to that. But there has a number of things that need to fall in place before we get a date. But um, that'll be a great opportunity, you know, a week dedicated to uh, to just UAS and aviation safety. Um, and I think it's gonna bring in a number of other stakeholders that typically aren't involved. Yep. Um, so it may bring some life into this and, and you know, gives us an opportunity to really focus and get granule on how to yep. operate safety in the airspace. And I know one of the things you talked about a minute ago was you know, how we have a lot of clubs that have stepped up and helped lead the charge on educating new pilots and, and 
bringing, being very welcoming of these of the drone pilots that are coming to their clubs to want to fly there. And you know, we hear stories on both sides of that. We hear stories about clubs not wanting to accept any drone pilots. We have clubs that are being very accepting and kind of teaching them. Here's what you do to fly safely. Here's you know here's some other th aspects of model aviation you may not have been exposed to, yeah. um, and getting them interested in you know fixed wing and helicopters and all sorts of different things. So um, you know those clubs I think really stand out as being incredibly helpful oh, in sure. that in that mission that we have. So sure. Um, one of the things that was included in the most recent FAA reauthorization bill was. Uh, safety knowledge test. This is something that gets to, has been getting a lot of uh, a lot of play in social media and that sort of thing. Oh, yeah. and, uh, so, what do we know as of today about the safety and knowledge test? What this is going to look like? So, I hear all kinds of things on the safety and knowledge test too, um, <laughs> and, and you know, it's people, uh, some of the things I hear, it's just, they're dead set, this is what's gonna happen. And that's great to know because AMA and the FAA is not aware of that. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's it's still early in this process, the safety and knowledge test requirement. AMA and Consumer Technology Association, we led a round table uh, back in April, I believe it was, with the FAA, uh, to, and that was one of the things discussed. It was, what should this safety and knowledge test look like? And the other thing, topic discussed was um, CBO, community-based rec uh, organization recognition. Mm -hmm. um, but on the safety and knowledge test, initially we heard things like it was gonna mirror part 107, it was gonna be a, a multi-hour test. Um, and the industry got concerned, so we said, you know, we need to reach out and yeah. talk with the FAA on this and see if this is the path that they're going. Um, what we left that round table with was consensus um, or near consensus that this test needs to be extremely, extremely basic. It needs to focus on how people can operate safely and how or where people can find the tools to operate yeah. safely. Rather than knowing every single aspect of the airspace, where can you go to get the answers that you need to some of these questions? Yeah. I mean, it's, um, you know, it's, we want, a 10 year old kid to be able to still go out and fly. Right. Uh, we don't want them to have to memorize how to read weather charts and hmm. um, you know discuss medical conditions and things like that. Yeah. That's just too high level. So, yeah. um, and we think that's where we'll land. Uh, we think that it will be a basic test. It will cover the extreme basics. Um, we want this to be short. We don't want it to be multi hours. We want people to be able to finalize it and finish yeah. it up in a few minutes. Um, we want there to be a number of locations people can take it at. It would be nice if you come to AMA Expo or a club event and you're not a member that maybe there's a written version you can mm -hmm. check the answers off to right there and maybe you can go out and fly. So, is, is there any talk about making it like an online test? For it folks? will be online um, and that's probably where a majority of people will find it is, yeah. is going to be an online test. Um, the issue we, we have and we would like to see a paper version is because some of our clubs don't have Wi-Fi signals oh, and sure. things like that. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, a majority of people will take it online. There'll probably be a small, um, I don't want to say a training course, but um, you know, there may be some reading material and then a few questions you'll answer. Um, we don't know the number of the questions. We don't know. Um, it's, it's still early. I'll say questions are being developed. AMA is part of the uh, review board for the questions. Um, so we're seeing those, we're reviewing those, we're making tweaks as we get them uh, and working with the FAA closely on that. Um, but we still don't have a set number on how many questions are gonna be there and what that training or, or reading material is yeah. going to look like when we get done. So. Well, I think it's important, to, as, you, as you just pointed out, to emphasize that AMA is gonna be part of that decision-making process for that knowledge test. I know, you know there's so much, as, as you mentioned, misinformation that's out there about, you know, <laughs> What, no, this is going to be um, going to mirror the 107 test, and and this, this, and that, and um, there just none of that has is true. There's no basis in fact on any of that stuff because those decisions haven't even been made yet. Yeah, a lot of them haven't, and and that's not just with the test. I mean, that's with everything. Is there's there's a lot of misinformation. Yeah, uh, look to AMA 
for your information. Yeah. Um, you know, we're working with the FAA. We're having daily meetings, sometimes hourly meetings with yeah. a number of organizations. Things are changing every day. Um, so just because we, you know, we're trying to pin this down as quickly as we can and get this implemented, um, but things are changing. So we have to remain flexible. We're, we're hesitant to put information out until we know that it's 100% you know, in stone that this is the way that we're going to move forward yeah. because we don't want our, you know, all of our clubs to focus their resources on one path when we end up changing it the next day. So um, we've been a little hesitant in, in sharing things that we feel like can change. But as soon as we know that it's in stone, we're going to get that information And that's, now. that's something that, um, you know, we've experienced in, in, in a various different situations in the past where people feel like we may have been a little late getting messaging out or, um, you know, we, well, we, you, you took two or three days to, to make, to comment on X, Y, Z. There's a reason yeah. for that because I mean, I don't know how much of that you can really t talk about, but it's like, it's not because we didn't know. It's not because, you know, we were trying to spin it a certain way, whatever that people theorize online. But yeah, yeah. that's that, that, when we first started this process with the, the letter of agreement process, I'll use it as an example. If we send messaging out when our first decision was made in that process, our clubs would have probably gotten about 10 emails saying, no, we changed again. No, we changed again. Yeah. I mean, that is literally how often that we yes. were we were changing the process. And that wasn't AMA that was changing the right. process. This is this is how data is being collected in DC with the FAA and and how you know maybe the air traffic wants another part to be incorporated in this. Mm -hmm. um, so there's so many moving pieces in this process that if we send it out as soon as we learn, we're probably going to need to send you a dozen emails to correct it <laughs> by the time we're done. So and, um, and look, nobody needs a dozen more nobody emails. Nobody needs in their a inbox. dozen more emails. And, and so if you have to wait a day or two to get get the information, um, yeah. we're we're trying to do that for your benefit. Right. Um, you know, are there any of the any other pieces of misinformation you've been seeing or hearing from from members that you would be you would like to clear up? Uh, you know, we get a lot of questions. There's a UAS facility map that the FAA published, and it's got our fixed flying site locations on there. And I don't know if you've seen it, but we're represented with uh, blue circles at our club locations and controlled airspace. Yeah. Um, I just like to clear up those are only our clubs and controlled airspace number one. So if you're an uncontrolled or class G, you will likely never appear on that map. Yeah. And also, that is not a complete list. Um, that is in complete data that was that was used um, just because something had to be put out to meet yeah. some deadlines. So right. um, we know that clubs may be located a half mile down the road. We know that there are about 150 clubs missing from that UAS facility map. That does not mean you cannot operate. That means that the FAA has not updated it yet. Right. So there's a number of clubs operating that are not on that map. They are going through the letter of agreement process now, or they've already completed their letter of agreement process. They still may not be on the map. Um, so while that map is a, a decent tool um, for some locations, we understand that there is a lot of, of data that needs corrected on that. Um, and we hope to see that yeah. get updated soon. So. And, and you know, I think part of that data collection process we've been uh, doing over the last couple of months, sending messages out to clubs, mm -hmm. you know, saying, hey, we need your GPS coordinates yep. for your club. We need, you know, because this is all information that the FAA needs to kind of figure out how this is going to work. Sure. And, and it's it's all about cooperation, in my opinion. Right. Yeah. And you know, there's there's been some issues. You know, we've we've had to work through some incorrect lats and longs and things like that given yeah. by a few clubs. Um, but that's not a big issue. If if you're if you have any questions, um, if you want to make sure that you're using the right lat and long format, things like that, just reach out to headquarters. Yeah. We're happy to help. Um, we've been doing it now for a couple months, so yeah. um, we're in the groove and happy to help and make sure that your club gets represented. Yeah. Um, so again, it's it's going to be a bumpy process. There's going to be a lot of hurdles along the way, but we will come out the other side. We will yes. be flying next year just like we were last year. Yeah. Um, so let's just bear with us. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can't. I can't agree more with that. I think you know, everybody just kind of needs to take a deep breath and right. let's let's 
relax and things aren't as bad as what I think some people try to, to, to or seem to think that it is. And we're working hard every day. You guys, your team is working very hard every day to make sure that, as you said, we're going to be flying a year from now, just like we were flying last year. So. Yeah. A lot of the new, I mean, there is a lot more administrative work, yeah. but AMA headquarters is trying to take on as much of that as we can right. so that our clubs and our members don't have to do that. Right. Um, so, you know, there will be some more administrative work. We may need you to answer some questionnaires along the way, um, but all of this will help us make the case to the FAA, yep. get letters of agreement in place, and, and keep people up flying. At the end of the day, we're committed to you know be as transparent as we can be, and it's one of the reasons we wanted to have this discussion, and and we'll have future discussions as well as things you know change and develop. And um, again, if people have questions, I please reach out to the to AMA headquarters. Um, they can reach out to you guys by email as well. Yep. Um, your email is Tyler D at modelaircraft.org. Very good. Um, and of course, go to modelaircraft.org. Um, we've got tons of information out there for folks to to read up on and to familiarize yourself with, and you can contact us through that as well. Um, Tyler, is there anything else that you think is important to put out there? I think that covers it. Uh, appreciate you giving me the opportunity to discuss some of the things that's going on. Um, there's a lot going on. Things yeah. are changing. So um, maybe we can do this again soon and give another update. And uh, I would just stress to our members, before you panic, reach out to AMA headquarters. Yeah. We're here to help. So um, let's, uh, you know, we AMA will reach out to the FAA. Uh, we want to hear it for ourselves if, if a club uh, is being shut down or something like that. Yeah. So please do. Cool. Well, Tyler, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, until next time, we'll see you guys later. And uh, let's go outside and do some flying. There you go. Thanks.